Oh. Or there's a button right up there by the battery. Yeah. No, it looks like a couple of volunteers. Like it records when it's not recording. I think it's recording anyway. Oh, okay. I don't know. It's weird. Yes, but it's well, if it works, it works. It doesn't. We're just going to look in for help to fix the microphone, okay? Oh, there's a microphone in here? Yes. Somewhere there is to fix it so that you can be heard. I know. So that's good. Got storage in there. Just doesn't want to stay on. Um, Okay, cool. Would you like a pillow or something? I can make one of my stitch. No, I'm good. I mean, if you're gonna lie, you're kind of like a No, I'm good. No, it's well. It's a lot. It's a lot. Anybody need a hand out? Raise your hand and I'll rush it back to you. Oh, I need that. I'll leave them right here. Maybe we can put them in the back in case anybody comes late. Good afternoon, everyone. It's my blessing and privilege to be with you. My name is Father Tom. Father Tom Bonacci, but I go by my first name, Tom. I am a passionist from Citrus Heights, California, the Christ the King Passionist Retreat House. I believe we have a booth here in our exhibit area that you are more than welcome to visit. I'll try to be there and be nice to people. <laughs> <laughs> it's always my blessing and privilege to be back in the Diocese of Reno. So I feel like coming home every time that I come here. Mm -hmm. I realize that it's late in the day, and I also know it's kind of warm at the moment, but we'll do the best that we can. Everybody should have a set of notes that's six pages long. As you know, one of the ways I use the notes is to be able to give you the scripture so you can have references later on to the scripture and any sources that we use for our work. But I also maintain the freedom to supplement that for whatever comes up in the course of our reflection this afternoon. So I'd like to make about a 45 minute presentation, maybe a little bit longer than that, and then open it up for a discussion if you're so inclined. I'm not in a hurry to be anywhere else, so when the session comes to an end, if you would like to continue any conversation, I'd be more than happy to do that with you, not only today, but I'll be here all day tomorrow as well. There are three sessions for this, but I designed it so that each session stands all by itself. May I ask how many of you are teachers in the diocese? Well, welcome, and in a special way, I'd like to thank you for your work. Teachers, of course, are generally presumed. <laughs> but thank you for loving the children. Thank you for doing what you're doing. And I would like to dedicate what we're doing here this afternoon, especially to your ministry, your work, and your life. I would like to think that any time we study the scripture, we find ourselves in the modality of prayer. So we pray to God to continuously outpour the Holy Spirit into our mind and hearts as we open ourselves up to the presence of God and the love for the poor and the stranger among us. 
Let me begin by inviting you to imaginatively think, suppose you had the conscious awareness that you were a disciple of Jesus. <laughs> suppose for a moment you had the conscious awareness 24-7 <coughs> that you and Jesus have this relationship that is not simply that he's one who assures you of your salvation so that you have a consumerist understanding of religion, what's in it for me and how do I benefit? But suppose you had this relationship with Jesus by which you understood that to love him would be to love who he loves. Suppose that the following of Jesus was not simply for the sake of yourself, your salvation, and your well-being, but you so loved him because you wanted to be like him, so through the power of the Holy Spirit he could empower you to be his risen presence in the broken world. Suppose you and I had that consciousness. There was not just simply something we believed in, or something we studied, or something we thought was dogmatically cute, or sweet, or devotionally benign, but was actually the way we lived our lives. Suppose we looked at Jesus from the viewpoint of the reality that's reflected in the New Testament proclamation. The first thing we would discover about this Jesus and our following of Jesus is the strange element we're following someone who was executed for treason. We tend to talk about Jesus in terms of dogmatic purity, pietistic loveliness, liturgical splendor. But the reality is, all of the ways in which we celebrate Jesus are none of the ways in which he lived. He never saw a cathedral liturgy. He was never the immediate subject of the prison mass. His nativity was not celebrated the way we celebrate Christmas. In his execution, nobody sang, lift high the cross, or come let us adore him. We follow someone who was profoundly crucified. As a matter of fact, according to Pilate, the crime against him was put on the cross, Jesus the Nazarene, the king of Judea, or the king of Israel. When everybody knows that the king of Israel is Caesar Augustus and his puppet kings Herod and Pilate. So for Jesus to come along and say, I proclaim the kingdom of God in your midst as an act of treason. You don't run around in the kingdom of Caesar and talk about this kingdom of God because everybody knows that the kingdom belongs to Caesar. We're celebrating the Christmas season right now, heading into Epiphany, where the doors go wide open to the world where the Magi come from afar. It's not too long ago that we heard the uncompromising gospel of the angels singing to the shepherd, this very night in David's town, your Savior is born, Christ the Lord. For us, that has become the object of Christology, the sophisticated study of Jesus the dogmatic implications of the New Testament proclamation. But if we simply take one of those titles, this very night in Bethlehem, in the city of David, your Savior is born, we can see the act of treason. The angel should have been arrested on the spot by the Roman police. <coughs> your Savior is born in the city of David. When everybody knows the word Savior refers to Caesar Augustus. He's the Savior of the world. He's the source of peace. The liturgy preserves the language of Augustus when we say, peace be with you. The Pax Romanum. And the way you had the peace of Rome in your heart is if you buckle under and submit it. 
along comes this Jewish peasant from Galilee who talks uncompromisingly of the kingdom of God in the kingdom of Caesar. Perhaps the song of the angels that enraptured the shepherds never stopped resounding in the mind, heart, and soul of Jesus. What does it mean to be savior? To kill people who disagree with you? To shut them out or to meet them? Suppose you and I, as disciples of Jesus, so radically followed after Jesus that we did in our lives what he did with his. Instead of simply saying, I believe in Jesus as my Savior, perhaps if I said this, I follow after Jesus, implementing the ethics of salvation in the here and now of my life. Suppose you live in a country where the powers to be said, there's a caravan of evildoers coming from the south. Or there's a caravan of evildoers coming from the north. What would you do? <laughs> Several weeks ago, I was in Denver at the Society of Biblical Literature, the American Academy of Religion. I like to go to sophisticated conferences. <laughs> I go to sophisticated conferences for at least a couple hours, I can feel sophisticated. <laughs> I think if I hang around intelligent people, I'll become intelligent. I think if I hang around holy people, I'll become holy. I said to one woman, hello, my name is Tom, who are you? She said, my name is Beverly. I said, I'm from Citrus Heights, California. She said, I'm from the border. What border? Down in Texas, some border town. I forget the name. She said, oh, you feel threatened. Oh, no. The border towns on the United States, they're centers of welcome. When we heard troops were coming to prevent the caravan from entering, The women of the communities got together to open the churches up as centers of welcome. I said, don't tell me, don't tell me you're a disciple of Jesus Christ. <laughs> How did you know? <laughs> I said, because you open doors where everybody else builds walls. You have forgiveness where everybody else has resentment. You have joy where everyone else has hatred. You went to Bethlehem. This very night, in the border town, your savior is born. Suppose you and I had that sense. What would the world look like? Well, as a matter of fact, that's exactly what you did. Several years ago, you had a synod for the diocese. And you asked a question that I don't think too many people ask. With the inspiration of your bishop, you were discerning how can the church of northern Nevada be of service to all people? Not how can the church of northern Nevada insulate itself from all people? How can we preserve ourselves against that evil, wicked diocese called Las Vegas? <laughs> how can we keep those Californians under control? <laughs> How can we be of service to all people? Don't you want to preserve your territory? Doesn't this land belong to you? And so what I would like to explore with you for a few moments is where did Jesus derive this ethos, this way of thinking? What is the heritage that was given to him that connects him to the poor, the broken, and the hated. You see, I'm the kind of person left to myself, I want what I want when I want it. And one of the things I want is security for myself, insurance for myself. I want to be able to say, I worked for 50 years, I now want the benefit of it for myself. I don't want praise, I want security. 
I once said to Jesus in prayer, I follow after you. I believe you. What's in it for me? <laughs> he said, the privilege, the privilege of being like me. I don't want the privilege of being like you. I want the benefits for believing in you. <laughs> What's the payoff? Like those great preachers on the TV tell you, that if you believe in Jesus, there'll be money in your bank account. There'll be health in your body. There'll be wealth in your life. There'll be security and salvation. I don't see any of that. <laughs> My bank account is committing suicide as we stand here. <laughs> I go to the doctor. He says, well, you're doing pretty well for someone your age. <laughs> what do you mean my age? Well, it's going downhill. <laughs> really? I said, I believe in Jesus. He said, good for you. <laughs> you still have a vitamin deficiency and your oxygen levels are low, which can account for why you think the way you think. <laughs> John the Baptizer said what I think Jesus said. I must decrease that you might increase. He gave his life for us. No one takes my life, I get it. It's odd to be a disciple of Jesus and wonder how you can possess something when Jesus teaches you how to give it away. That's the difference between the kingdom of Caesar and the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of Caesar, you're better off because of what you have. In the kingdom of God, you're better off because of what you give. And when you have nothing left to give, when you have no help, no wealth, no time, you can then give the greatest gift of all yourself. Freed from all that accumulation, I can flow like water for the welfare of the other. Where did Jesus get this from? And of course, over half of his parables, I think, quick survey in my head, half of his parables have to deal with the land. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. The kingdom of God is like a field. The kingdom of God is like the wheat. In Matthew's Gospel, that the wishes parable, the kingdom of God is like the weeds in the wheat. And the great question was, who planted the weeds in the midst of the wheat? We're in the kingdom of Jesus. Who planted the wheat in the midst of the weeds? <laughs> Who was that person that stuck into my life and planted flowers in my thorns and wheat in my weeds and hope in my despair, light in my darkness and love in my hatred? You see the difference between the kingdom of Caesar and the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God, the door is open. In the kingdom of Caesar, the door is slammed shut. Be very, very careful. When someone says, do you believe in Jesus? Because you might want to answer that with, can I read the small print first? <laughs> I like the Jesus who benefits me. I don't like the Jesus who makes me beneficial. I want to spend my entire life tearing myself down so there's nothing to give. He spends his entire life lifting us up so there's everything to give. Where does he get this from? I think he gets it from the earth. Once I imagined that as a boy, Jesus, he went down to Lake Galilee in his bare feet so that the earth could tickle his feet, tingle something in his soul, and excite something in his memory. As the great Jewish community teaches us, there's an affinity between God and humanity, and the connecting point is the earth, the land. There's something about the earth and the land that speaks to the splendor of God. And as you know, the earth is never flat. You can have the great plains, 
that as you look upon them, they reach out to infinity. You can have the mountains that inspire the song, I lift up my soul. You can have the valley down into the depth of my heart. To become aware of the terrain. If you ever fly in an airplane in a long flight, you can feel the geography. You can feel the earth because the movement of the plane is in direct proportion to plane, field, mountain, valley, lake, river, and ocean. You can lift your eyes to the mountains. You can look out a window and see a snow-capped mountain and have a divine experience. There's something about the earth that touches us deeply. Most of ancient Jewish religion dealt with gathering seed and gathering grain. So that the great feasts like Sukkot, Tabernacles, and Passover had everything to do with the yield of the earth. Even at Thanksgiving time, which inaugurates the Christmas season for many of us, it begins with gratitude and thanksgiving for the fruits of the earth, for the work of human hands. We see the extraordinariness of the gift of food in Thanksgiving. What is ordinary in the rest of the year is extraordinary in the harvest time. We celebrate great birth. We celebrate great death in the eating and the drinking. That's the fruit of the earth. Even the liturgy of the church. Blessed are you, shepherd of all creation. Because of your goodness, we have this bread to offer. It is the fruit of the earth the work of human hands, it will become for us the bread of life. The gift of nature and the gift of technology marry in the spirit. Blessed are you, shepherd of all creation, because of your goodness, we have this wine to offer. It is the fruit of the vine, the work of human hands. It will become for us the drink of life. Standing. The earth the God, meat, and the land. In the book of Leviticus, in the book of Numbers, there's all kind of prescriptions and laws that deal with the regulation of the earth. How you glean, how you harvest, how you gather in the fruits of the earth. And it's all based on the idea the seed that is scattered is grain that is gathered. And then along comes a passage that almost made me pass out with joy. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 27, verses 12 to 13. One of the things we know about the people of Israel the Israelites, the Hebrews, the Jews, they spend more time out of the land than in the land, and when they're in the land, it's nothing but trouble. <laughs> As one rabbi said to me, in the faith, this is a promise. <laughs> and the metaphor that is used in the scripture is that a people who are scattered will be gathered. Our brothers and sisters in the world are scattered because of imperialistic power, political hatred, racial and religious strife, ethnic collapse, immorality, amorality. They seek some place to be gathered. Isaiah who lived through a profound exile of the people, has God say to the people, it's astounding, Isaiah 27, 12 to 13, 
I will pick you up as grains of wheat and carry you home. See, while in the kingdom of Caesar, an army is going out to kill a people, in the kingdom of God, the almightiness of God is out in the land picking up little grains to take you home. Little grains to take you home. O oh, children of Israel, as grain scattered on the ground, I will pick you up one by one and take you home. Not a mighty movement, but an almighty God who is so powerful that gentleness can abound. Do you ever drop all your change on the ground? And notice that when you drop your change on the ground, all of the coins know how to roll perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> if you tried to do that deliberately, they'd all be flat. And they'd go all over the place. Once I did an experiment in an elevator, I dropped a hundred dimes deliberately on the floor in a crowded elevator. And everybody went, oh my sir, we'll help you pick them up. I said, I don't even know you people. I said, if it were me, I'd keep it. And they all went, oh here's one. And they picked it up one by one and handed it back. That was the scattered for the gathered. The great God is so powerful that the great God runs around the universe and picks us up one by one. Would you like to go home? No. Well, you're going home anyway. Would you like to be loved? No. I'm going to love you anyhow. Would you love to be forgiven? No. I will forgive you anyhow. Would you love to be cherished? No. I'll cherish you anyway. See, the almightiness of God means no obstacle to God being God. I'm not almighty because there's tons of obstacles to me being me. My mother used to say to me, Tommy, do you think you could be nice to people? It's a possibility. <laughs> I'll entertain. I don't know if I want to engage her. And then I said to my mother, what's in it for me? And she said, that's your problem. Mothers don't ask what's in it for them. Fathers don't ask what's in it for them. <coughs> if their child 